And we're going to find out from this panel, um, as was alluded to, um, what is going on um, to prevent systemic risk now in the, in the marketplace. And um, it occurred to me, and uh, one of my Board of Advisors members, David Hannon, who is here somewhere, uh, we were talking in the corridors, and uh, we really do have uh, clashing cultures here. Um, so, for example, I mentioned the FSOC is taking up this issue this, mor this morning. What I failed to mention is that the vast majority of FSOC and the culture of FSOC is banking-centric. Um, and <clears throat> we're having a, uh, a separate one-day conference um, on April 3rd, and the, the flyer for it is here and also on the table. And to the bankers of the world, um, all you asset managers who self-identified as such are known as not asset managers, but shadow bankers. <laughs> you may think that you're an asset manager, but what you really are to the banking community is shadow bankers. Um, that'll damage your self-esteem, I'm sure, <laughs> a lot. Uh, but I think that's a large part of what we're, what we're dealing with here. We have bank regulation, as Dave Hannett pointed out, uh, primarily to, to protect the deposit insurance fund and the taxpayers. And we know from recent experience that they can suffer losses. But we don't really have a history of, uh, of an insurance fund or uh, taxpayers uh, suffering losses as a result of um, stress in the financial, uh, in the asset management industry, with the possible exception of money market mutual fund. Anyway, to help us sort through all, all this, we have a, a profound panel led by Troy Paredes. Uh, Troy, um, we all saw the movie Inside Job, right? Maybe? <laughs> Inside Job? Uh, well, there was a certain Fed governor who was interviewed in that movie. Uh, who was uh, exiting his post at the Fed in 2008, just as we going, were going into the crisis. Troy, on the other hand, e either uh, knowingly or unknowingly, uh, was marching straight into the flames of hell at that time at the <laughs> SEC. <laughs> but uh, now he's at the PwC in their regulatory practice. Uh, he teaches at the University of Pen Pennsylvania uh, and at Harvard. Uh, that's here. Sits in the area, um, and we're, we're delighted to, to have his wisdom and coordinating abilities with us today. Troy? All right, thank you. Thanks um, for the introduction. What I'm going to do here is, is just quickly introduce the panelists, the longer, uh, very impressive bios are in the materials, and then I'm going to set the stage uh, very briefly, and then I'm going to give each of the panelists a little bit of time to uh, get whatever they want to get off their chest uh, on the topic, and I know that uh, Henry's going to uh, share some thoughts about some of his research, then we're going to get into the discussion and make sure we have plenty of time for Q&A. So that's the game plan uh, going forward. So let me uh, start by a quick introduction of Buddy Donahue. And Buddy and I had a chance to work together when we were at the SEC during uh, the financial crisis. And Buddy is a, a good friend. He's also the former director of the Division of Investment Management at the SEC. And right now, he's Deputy General Counsel uh, at Goldman Sachs uh, Asset Management. And next, we have Richard Lakai, uh, who I just had the chance uh, to meet. Um, and he's the executive VP and the global chief investment officer for State Street Global Advisors. We have Professor uh, Henry Hugh, who I've known for a long time, going back to my uh, acad uh, academic days as well. And he's the former director of the SEC's division of RiskFin, which is the division of economists that now has a new name, but it was what's known as uh, RiskFin. And he's also the Alan Shivers chair uh, at the University of Texas uh, Law School. And we have uh, Akshat Tiwari, who's the president of Occupy the SEC, uh, Inc. So we have a diverse group uh, here, so I think it promises to be uh, a lively uh, discussion. So as for the framework, let me actually say uh, this at the outset. When I was at the SEC, I gave a disclaimer. My views aren't those of the SEC. Now that I'm at PwC, it turns out they want me to give a disclaimer, uh, <laughs> which, is, which is to say <laughs> that my views, and I will express a few probably, uh, are my own, or not necessarily those of PwC or any of its uh, any of its clients. So, with that out of the way, let me set the set the stage very briefly. As as I think about this, and we'll get into some of the particulars, uh, I broke it down uh, this panel in the following way. There is, in fact, a threshold question, and it's in part what the prior panel uh, got to, which is whether or not asset management even poses uh, a risk to financial uh, stability. I think that question is going to be less the focus. Uh, this panel, that there may be some touching on it. And I do think the question that came up 
on the last panel about what really is financial stability, what, if you want to put it in different terms, really is systemic risk, what do we mean by that, uh, is itself, of course, a very important uh, related question. Uh, next, though, is this, and I think this is really starts to introduce the meat of the matter for this particular panel. E even if asset management were to pose uh, a risk to financial stability, I want to stress the, the even if. It's not by way of concession on my point to go to this question. But even if it were to do so, who and how should the industry be regulated? Right? That really is what the question uh, boils down to in many of the debates that are going on right now. A and related to that is the following. Even if asset management posed some risk to financial stability, is the only source of a solution the government? Or is it the case that market participants, the asset managers themselves, have incentives to try to uh, mitigate the risk uh, and that the market itself can go a long way, if not all the way, particularly on a cost-benefit basis, uh, to addressing their concerns, thereby further obviating the need for any uh, government uh, regulation in this space. Uh, and then the third uh, question is, if the government were inclined uh, to do more in this space, uh, what does it take to justify uh, regulation? And in my uh, personal view, uh, and you've heard this word already and you'll probably hear it some more, uh, it ought to take, and in fact I think it does uh, take, more than conjecture and speculation, uh, that the justification and the burden uh, is borne by the government to uh, regulate, frankly, uh, in my view, and that that should require data, uh, evidence, serious economic uh, analysis, uh, and conjecture, speculation, and the like isn't a sufficiently sound basis uh, upon which to uh, impose new regulations. So that gives you uh, a little bit of a said framework for how I think about uh, this panel shares with you a few of my views. I think at this point, I'll largely turn it over to the panelists to share their views uh, and then try to get into the Q&A. So let me just uh, start, I think, with uh, Henry, if that's uh, okay, uh, and then we'll turn to the other panelists uh, and uh, go from there. So Henry. Uh, thank you, uh, Troy. Uh, Henry, you're not gonna read all of that, are you? No, okay, no, just no. <laughs> uh, uh, whatever I know, I have to read from here. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank uh, Khan and uh, Paul for uh, uh, setting up this exceptional conference, uh, giving me a chance to uh, get together with uh, Troy, Buddy, Craig, and Commissioner Gallagher once again. Um, uh, and in terms of this panel on uh, regulation and financial stability, I want to talk about something that really hasn't been focused on thus far today. I want to talk about how public disclosure, the relationship between public disclosure and financial stability. At first glance, in the specific context of banking and shadow banking, a robust informational predicate uh, can often help reduce systemic risk. So that for banks, uh, Basel's pillar three emphasized the market discipline that can flow from public disclosures and how it can supplement the pillar one capital adequacy rules and pillar two bank super supervising supervisory rules in ensuring bank soundness, and uh, certainly there have been concerns in terms of the disclosures of too big to fail banks with large uh, exposures to <clears throat> derivatives and other financial products. And in terms of shadow banking, as we all know, in terms of the global financial crisis, all kinds of informational asymmetries and related frictions relating to asset-backed securities contributed in large measure to the global financial crisis. Okay, so, some light, generally speaking, i.e. a robust informational predicate, as a very general matter, uh, probably does help reduce systemic risk. But then the issue comes up, how do you create this robust informational predicate in this kind of modern world with complicated projects like deriv certain derivatives and complex asset-backed securities? Uh, let me now talk, let me talk about first in the context of the SEC, which, uh, of course, has been at the core, at the heart of mandatory public disclosure since its creation. And three basic questions arise. First, uh, just how does the SEC basically go about fostering this robust informational predicates? What is its basic approach to information? Second, does this classic approach or mode of information still work in today's world? Uh, does it capture the kinds of risks, for instance, that too big to fail banks uh, may have or certain asset backed securities may have? Third, if that classic approach 
isn't sufficient, what can be done either within the SEC disclosure universe or in the context of a brand new public disclosure system that just came into effect in 2013? A, the first new public disclosure system since the creation of the SEC, one developed and administered by bank regulators and not devoted to the classic transparency ends of investor protection and uh, market efficiency, but instead primarily di directed at the entity of individual banks and minimization of systemic risk. How do the two disclosure universes relate to each other? Okay, now, because I only have about 10 minutes um, in this segment, I'm gonna probably just focus on one and two and touch very, very lightly in terms of number three, how to deal with this issue and the relationship between two universes. First, the how question. You can reconceptualize what the SEC has basically been doing since 1934. How does it approach information? Basically through a particular mode of information that I refer to as a descriptive mode, relying on intermediary depictions. The basic idea is this. An intermediary, such as a corporation issuing shares, okay, or a company uh, re reporting regularly to its investors, looks at objective reality analyzes it and crafts a depiction that it then transmits to investors. So investors, uh, uh, in effect, rely on these intermediary depictions for information. And in terms of the energies of the intermediary, as well as of securities regulators, underwriters in case of an offering, accountants, lawyers, uh, risk professionals, and others, are all tr focused on trying to make those intermediary depictions accurate and complete. This reliance on intermediary depictions is so overwhelming and so seemingly inevitable that when you talk about information, public information, you largely conceive of it in terms of, if, you're not, if not equated to such depictions. Second, does this descriptive mode of information based on intermediary depictions really work? Is it really sufficient? Consider, for example, financial innovation. In fact, the issue comes up in all kinds of other contexts, pension accounting and others. Financial innovation poses two basic roadblocks to good intermediary depictions. First big roadblock is Modern financial innovation is creating objective realities that are far more complex than in the past and often beyond the capacity of the English language, accounting terminology, visual display, risk measurement, and other tools on which all depictions must primarily rely. The depiction tools are very rudimentary, even modern risk measurement tools and how they're reported, value at risk, stress tests, and the like, are extraordinarily crude in characterizing what may happen either in normal circumstances or in extreme circumstances. Uh, for too big to fail banks, uh, this is an example of an uh, annual report to shareholders from uh, one too big to fail bank. Uh, these reports are reaching some kind of physical obesity limit. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm getting old. I need magnifying glasses <laughs> to look at all the value at risk and stress test numbers and like. And yet, people like Paul Singer, the famous hedge fund manager, with hundreds of people, expert in risk analysis, PhDs, claims he can't understand what makes these banks tick, especially in terms of derivatives. So in terms of, that's one roadblock, in terms of depiction tools. This is a second fundamental roadblock. Financial innovation, uh, in terms of these intermediary depictions, they depend on the intermediary really 
understanding the objective reality. All right. Well, the intermediary may not really understand the objective reality. And number two, in addition to such true misunderstandings, there could be functional misunderstandings. That is, they may not ex act as if they understand the objective reality. And I'm assuming a completely well-intentioned intermediate, financial intermediary. I'm not assuming any kind of fraud or misbehavior on the part of anyone. And this second roadblock uh, could result from simply the financial products or strategies being too complex. <coughs> also, in terms of the functional misunderstanding, could we relate from things like organizational complexities, the, the classic siloing of information problems within large banking organizations. Uh, if even the intermediary does not understand objective reality, or acts as if it does not understand objective reality, how can any intermediary depictions it offers um, uh, make, uh, uh, be accurate and complete? Uh, if they could, if you, uh, excuse me, media services, could you uh, flip on the slide? Okay, um, I'm gonna touch lightly, as I said, on uh, some, of, some of my research. And in terms of the first item, that was published in uh, June, uh, 2012, based on a, a conference um, paper I presented in February, just of 2012, just a month before it was published, that is literally as the last stages of editing, the J.P. Morgan Chase London Whale credit derivatives debacle started emerging publicly. I quickly inserted a 11-page analysis based on the information at that time showing how the the, credit, the London Whale issue at J.P. Morgan illustrated both the depiction tools roadblock and the true and functional misunderstanding uh, roadblock. And there's a um, uh, later analysis in, in terms of the 2014 uh, article, um, uh, and can be downloaded those uh, uh, websites, and it also addresses uh, certain um, additional issues, okay, that uh, we'll talk about. Um, so just to be uh, a little bit more specific, again, I'm touching uh, very lightly. In terms of the first question, um, uh, it, uh, sorry, in terms of the third question, if this longstanding mode of information is insufficient, what should we do? Well, the first is you know, improve the implementation of the existing mode of information, that is this intermediary depiction mode. The SEC's basic guide, disclosure guide, uh, for uh, bank holding companies uh, was adopted in 1976. It basically has remained essentially unchanged. Remember what happened in 1976? The first Rocky came out in 1976. <laughs> in 1976, the Apple I was assembled and sold all of 175 units. Uh, and only because Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak had just sold their uh, VW uh, minibus and, and traded in, uh, Wozniak traded in his HP calculator, okay? Some things have happened since 1976. In terms of the basic market risk rule, SK305, which basically covers most of the issues in terms of the J.P. Morgan Chase London Whale uh, disaster. That rule was adopted in 1997 and never amended. And this is notwithstanding the fact that at its adoption in 1997, the SEC said when things progress, when we understand better market risk techniques, we'll revise the rule. Well, luckily the SEC is engaged in the disclosure effectiveness project where some of these issues may be addressed. Second, more fundamentally, I basically said the descriptive mode of information is a real problem, is a fundamental problem. Well, if complexities related to financial innovation are creating problems for the disclosure paradigm, technological innovation may contribute to its solution. With advances in computer and internet technologies, it's no longer essential to rely exclusively on intermediary depictions of reality. 
figuratively, the intermediary need not always stand between the investor and objective reality. Figuratively, the intermediary could move out of the way and let investors, especially institutional investors, find this data inf interesting, see objective reality, download objective reality in its full terabyte richness. And if that intermediary is out of the way, you eliminate some of the issues having to do with intermediary uh, uh, misunderstanding, functional or true, or problems with depiction tools, problem with accounting, uh, 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 accounting conventions or problems with risk measurement tools. Of course, in a, they involve other problems as well. Or more broadly, I basically argue that there should be an eclectic approach to information, a portfolio of modes of information ranging from the use of the standard descriptive model all the way to, at the other extreme, what I refer to as a transfer mode, that is transferring reality, if you will, to investors and pure information to stuff in the middle in terms of moderately pure information. Each one of the three modes of information has its own problems and advantages, just as stocks each have their own uh, benefits and disadvantages. That's why you need a portfolio in terms of having a diversified portfolio approaches to information. Finally, in terms of the, the new public disclosure system that the, SEC, that the Federal Reserve and other bank regulators adopted in the shadow of the Basel Committee and the Dodd-Frank Act. For the first time, for major banks today, they not only have to comply with SEC disclosure requirements in terms of market risk and so forth, but also the Federal Reserve System's provisions dealing with market risk and so forth. Frankly, at the moment, the Federal Reserve's requirements in terms of disclosures of market, of market risk are so much more sophisticated than the SEC's, that that's, in fact, where you find the good stuff. Well, you have two universes covering the same turf. You could see certain problems, and I won't touch on them now, but one of the basic ones is the Federal Reserve System has ends and means that differ radically from the traditional SEC system. It's not focused on investor protection and market efficiency. Very different notions, for instance, in terms of uh, material, uh, very different notions in terms of uh, what the reason for uh, disclosures are, and I can illustrate if I have time later on, and in terms of means, boy, the Definition of materiality is quite different. And unlike the SEC system, SEC system, unlikely to be able to have any kind of private class actions, just rely on public enforcement. Now, in sum, to conclude, this panel is called How Does Capital Market Regulation Address Financial Stability? Can it do more? Well, the basic approach to uh, information that the SEC has always used in terms of promoting uh, robust informational predicate, relying on descriptive mode, it, I basically argue is insufficient in the face of uh, the complex realities of today, and such as complex rela realities relating to financial innovation. But in terms of the title of the panel, you know, can we do more in terms of financial stability? I think that assumes a lot. Because, in fact, one of the key issues raised by the emergence of this brand new public disclosure system, okay, this independently developed from the SEC, is it raises a fundamental issue. To what extent should financial stability or the well-being of individual banks be the only goal? Or how do those two goals, how should those two goals be weighed by the sometimes competing interests of focusing on the protection of investors, especially the shareholders, and market efficiency. In fact, they can be in direct conflict. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks, Henry. Um, buddy. I have to follow? <laughs> 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 what did I do to you, Troy? <laughs> um, I have uh, but a, a few uh, brief comments. You know, 
Um, you know, as I look at the uh, asset management industry and then I look at the role of the SEC, uh, you know, I, I look at that and I believe in the markets. I believe in uh, allowing the markets to work. I believe, you know, that that anything the SEC can do and and, and should be um, focusing on is to make the markets work, to allow them to uh, to work. And the the sense that uh, there could be dislocations that might be caused by asset management to the extent that the markets are working effectively, uh, I think that allows price discovery. Uh, you wind up with better allocation of uh, resources in our economy, and I, I think it works much better than uh, anybody, uh, you know, in government in particular trying to make determinations about, uh, you know, what prices should be or, or uh, where, where uh, assets should be allocated. So, you know, I think there's many things that the uh, SEC can do, and I think it's within the mandate uh, that the SEC does have uh, you know, particularly fair, orderly, and efficient markets, I, th I think, uh, uh, are really important. Uh, and uh, I think I already ceded some of my time to Henry, so I'll, so I'll stop. <clears throat> so after we finish, Buddy, I'm going to come back and ask uh, what some of your thoughts are about what, perhaps what the SEC uh, could or should be doing. So Richard. Richard. Thank you. Um, maybe start off by saying that can, can more be done? I don't think we should ever give up hope. <clears throat> that regulations can be helpful, um, but I'm not gonna come with a line-by-line -line suggestion of what they might be, because I think the aspiration is very bold uh, to think that capital market regulation can do more at this point for financial stability. And I guess, echoing the previous panel, we need to define what that means, because financial stability doesn't mean a lack of volatility. In markets, price discovery is very important and requires a degree of volatility, um, but it, maybe it's a condition where um, access to capital becomes uh, impossible or unreasonable at, at a reasonable price, uh, which I think was a point that Al Reid made a little bit earlier. So when the FSB and the FSOC focused on issues uh, when they thought about asset management, such as the issue of leverage, um, that I think was an important point because if there's a conduit by which either funds or managers through leverage can then um, cause losses in the banking system which then in some ways impede uh, the ability of the economy to get access to credit, and obviously that is an issue. But most of the discussion we've had today uh, rightly identifies the fact that long-only mutual funds, long-only investors are not leveraged, therefore the likelihood of that happening through the leverage route is relatively modest. Uh, but it, it does exist. I mean, clearly there are leveraged investors who have quite high levels of leverage investing in volatile assets, and I think the, the way in which capital market regulation, I guess, deals with that is regulate the lenders. Regulate the lenders and ensure that they understand the correlation between the different strategies that they might be financing in order that they can uh, understand that tail risk uh, involved in, in leverage. Um, I think access to capital um, as a result of financial instability is an issue uh, that I think is extremely hard to solve. At the heart of it is the potential for risk to be mispriced. And there was a lot of discussion about herding and, and does herding exist? And I, I think that ICI uh, produced some convincing data at the aggregate level to suggest that it's not really existing. I think anecdotally what we see in, in, our, uh, in our business is that people's risk preferences definitely change over time. I wouldn't like to describe that as herding, that as a kind of pejorative uh, tone to it. But no doubt risk preferences um, change over time. And if you look back to where uh, capital formation has, has, has reached bubble proportions, the railway mania uh, in the UK in the 19th century, uh, there is no doubt that risk preferences can get out of line. And mispricing of capital can result in overinvestment, uh, which in turn can damage the economy. Regulation may not solve the problem there. Um, that's, uh, I think, uh, uh, an intrinsic part of the system, and in fact, it's quite independent of asset management. I mean, the asset management industry didn't exist as such in the 19th century. Investors made their own choices, and there was a degree of herding um, in those choices. I guess my, my aspiration and hope is when we, when we think about regulating the system and think about those issues of mispriced risks or leverage, that we make sure that we retain a degree of heterogeneity in the system. I think the US financial system and the UK European financial system has often been at its best when it is quite diverse, 
very different types of investors with different time horizons and to a certain extent different regulatory boundaries. And that is beginning to change. I think the growth of financial economics and the, uh, the, the understanding of financial economics and its influence on regulation um, has sometimes resulted in a little bit more pro-cyclical regulation and the tendency for, for more of our clients to be influenced in the same way by the same types of regulation um, at the same time, which can't be a good thing. So finding a way of putting more heterogeneity back in the system uh, I think is important. And when we think about asset managers, think about the level of discretion they have. There is a very, very wide spectrum between managers who, who can be large, but in the end clients have 100% discretion over those assets, and the, and the asset managers ability to misprice risks or, or, or themselves um, cause uh, markets to be out of line is somewhat constrained by the heterogeneity of the manager's client base uh, and the degree, the degree of discretion that the managers have. So I think I wouldn't be in denial that, that there's some interesting issues to examine around herding uh, leverage and the transmission mechanism back to the, back to the economy, but they're not easily tackled by the uh, some of the measures that might be proposed. And I think it's a, it's a major challenge to think that capital market regulation can, uh, can once and for all uh, deal a blow to financial instability. Terrific. Anna Akshat. Uh, thanks. Um, I want to first thank uh, Professor Hurley for the invitation. Uh, my name is Akshat Tawari. I'm with a nonprofit group called Occupy the ICC. We grew out of the uh, New York-based Occupy Wall Street movement. Uh, no need for fear. No one's going to, you know, attack the room or anything. Um, w uh, our interest really is in uh, the the topic that we're discussing today, which is uh, ensuring that the effects of financial market activities have limited impacts on the broader economy, um, particularly retail investors, as well as non-investors, just members of the public. Um, and, you know, from 2007 to 2010, we saw that median household wealth dropped 40 percent in the span of three years. And that's not because those households were necessarily investing in mortgage-backed securities. It's because of financial activities. So um, our interest in, is in avoiding similar drops in the future in the, in the nation's economy. And this to the topic that we're discussing today is of particular interest, systemic vulnerabilities, um, because I think that's one of the key ways that we can address some of those issues. Um, now, Obviously, there's, there's been a great deal of fraud and mismanagement in the fund industry, but that's not what we're talking about here today. Uh, we'll let Preet Bharara deal with that. I think today we're dealing with systemic issues that even, uh, I mean, assuming that every risk, uh, every um, investment advisor, every uh, investment company is dotting its I's, crossing its T's, doing everything perfectly, despite that, uh, despite the absence, complete absence of any wrongdoing, there can still be externalities that are produced due to collective action. And with collective action comes collective risk. And it's, the, uh, and it's the job of regulators to understand and to assay those risks and to um, promulgate regulation to address those risks. So, you know, that's, that's really what our, what our interest is. Um, in, in German philosophy, there's a concept called Gestalt, and I think that has uh, applicability here. It's not, just, it's not just about what you as an investment advisor are doing, or what your peer is doing, what your, uh, what your company is doing. Um, it's about broader externalities. And um, you know, I would posit that the regulators need more data to be able to actually effectively handle that situation. Great. So I'm going to turn to some questions. And shortly, we're going to turn to the audience. I think you can tell there's a range of perspectives. And, and including one of the points that was just made in terms of there being a great deal of fraud and mismanagement. My guess is, is there may be some folks on this panel and some folks in the audience who would, who would question whether or not, in fact, there's a, a great deal of fraud and mismanagement. But I think what you see, again, with the discussion is a diversity of perspective and take on this, which then informs folks' uh, policy views on these, on these topics. And so to that point, I want to turn to, to Buddy, and, and you had alluded to, you know, there are things that could, perhaps even from your perspective, should be done. Uh, that the SEC uh, could do in the asset management space. Chair White has articulated uh, a pretty robust agenda for reforms uh, in this space. Curious if you have any thoughts on what Chair White has suggested or other things that perhaps uh, the Commission could or should be doing or perhaps at least uh, considering uh, when it comes to the asset management industry. 
Um, in uh, December of uh, last year, Chair White did come out and uh, point to, I, th I think, five different tasks that uh, uh, investment management was going to be looking at that I think are directly on point with respect to uh, you know, the uh, potential risk that, that, uh, that may be out there. And, and I think uh, they, they are the right ones for focus to be, and they're not new. I mean, they've been ones that uh, that division has been looking at for, uh, for a number of years in order to uh, try and uh, assess them. I think, you know, looking at uh, things such as liquidity of portfolios and the, the potential for uh, uh, meeting redemptions and, and you, know, how, you know, what kind of uh, uh, work is being done in that area by firms, it, the whole area of risk management, which is uh, increasingly important uh, for, uh, uh, for money managers, you know, what is the role that that's playing and how should that, uh, that be looked at. I think there's a number of the, uh, the areas that, that, that Chair White has had focus on. Uh, you know, I also note, and, uh, you know, Commissioner Gallagher's in, in, the, in the audience, and, you know, he, he's been, in a way, leading the charge in terms of, you know, looking at, the, you know, the ability, really, of the markets. Uh, particularly in the bond markets, to be able to uh, provide liquidity and whether or not there's uh, areas that can be done there in market structure. And I think so the important areas, I think, that are fundamental, really, to the proper functioning of the, of the marketplace. And I, I think, you know, those are, are, you know, a few of the areas I, I would point to. And I'm going to encourage panelists to chime in and respond to, to each other and, and, and not take any question as just re, uh, directed towards one person. So if folks have, have other ideas in terms of what can and should be done, think about that. But I want to come to uh, Richard on, on a point uh, that you made. You referenced the importance of heterogeneity uh, in the marketplace. And one of the things you mentioned is you know, the potential for there to be even more heterogeneity put uh, into the marketplace. And so... I guess two sides of, of the question. One is, is uh, ideas, views on what in fact could be done to foster greater heterogeneity. And if you want to take the other side of that coin in terms of a question, you know, as you have others looking to regulate capital markets, bringing a, and the asset management industry, bringing a bank centric, if you will, kind of a bank, a regulatory perspective uh, to bear, if a bank-centric model were to be imposed upon the asset management industry, would that actually undercut the heterogeneity that you think is needed and, in fact, breed greater uh, homogeneity in a way that, in fact, could sow uh, seeds in a, in a counterproductive way of more uh, hurting, if you will, if hurting, in fact, is, uh, is a risk? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what that would look like in, in terms of um, regulating an asset manager like a bank. So let, let, me, let me move on from that. But the, the point of heterogeneity is that we have, I, I guess stating the obvious, we, we want the right people to be taking the right risks. And maybe as assets uh, leave the banking system, for example, in Europe, and, and fall into the hands of the right investors who can take the right risks, then it's pretty important that they might be regulated in the right way and that they don't, uh, they don't starve European economy, for example, of capital. I think the US system is a very good one in that regard because it does have quite a lot of diversity of sources of capital. But somehow that needs to be kept alive. And I think you know, the, the great risk is that more and more investors, end investors, may be subject to, and this is not an asset management point, may be subject to the sort of regulation that does create pro-cyclical behavior. And then you do have this challenge that capital may not be available at any price until you've got other investors who are you know, regulated in a different way, perhaps from other countries, perhaps sovereign wealth funds are able to, to step into the gap. And I think that, that is a, a really big problem. I, I think it's not easy to describe what the answer to that problem is. Uh, but if you describe, if, if you say well, the system always needs to have a certain amount of equity capital in it, and, and that's the essence of a lot of um, bank insurance, uh, pension fund regulation, and therefore, as the, the risk capital gets eroded, people need to delever or, or do different things. Well, the more people there are like that, uh, the, the less likely it is that you'll have a stable system. Now, you may have other people who are long-term uh, risk takers who want to deploy their liquidity. And you know, maybe there are, there are kind of emerging groups that should be regulated in a way that respects that 
ability and willingness to take risk. Uh, but I guess it's that homogeneity of, of approach that I think is the biggest challenge. It's not necessarily asset managers, could be, um, but I, th I think to a large extent, asset managers are the conduit. They're the conduit for choices that are made by end investors subject themselves to that regulation. And so it is a way to kind of bottom line that, that one way to make sure you have heterogeneity in the marketplace is to have heterogeneity in terms of the regulatory landscape as well. Well, I, th th this is a very difficult point because there's a very strong um, logic to harmonizing regulation, particularly when we think cross-border. We don't want people to, to be able to kind of arbitrage regulation, somehow have that um, uh, you know, optimal point being squeezed into to one particular country or, or sector of the market. But taking the other extreme, if you harmonize uh, to, uh, to a certain extent, you do force people into the same optimal spot. And I guess when that optimal spot becomes either overpriced or exhibits some, you know, some, some risk, then you'll find that there will be a, a sudden shift. And that, that in itself induces instability. So it's this kind of notion of corner solution or optimality that I think can be a little dangerous. Uh, so it does run against the trend of harm, wishing to harmonize regulation, which I completely understand. So, uh, Akshat, you, you have a unique perspective of not being in the government or not being in the, uh, you know, the private sector right now in terms of at an asset manager or other part of the marketplace. And so it'd be great to hear your thoughts in terms of looking forward, uh, ideas about what could or should be done. As I'd asked, uh, Buddy, Chair White has identified a robust agenda. There's lots of other ideas kicking around uh, out there. It'd be, uh, like I said, interesting to get your perspective uh, on what uh, perhaps could or should be done. Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, I think what I alluded to earlier uh, is the answer, basically increased data collection and repository by the government. Um, and the reason being because it's sort of attendant to the nature of the asset management industry. Uh, we're not talking about oligopolistic banks where you have five or six major players that dominate the industry. We have you know, hundreds or thousands of funds and advisors uh, which is sort of akin to the classical economic uh, perfect competition scenario where you have many different actors. And there's advantages to that. You have uh, inf efficiency, you have uh, risk mitigation because you know if one fund goes down, every, every other fund is not necessarily gonna go down just by that fact alone. Um, that's the plus side. The minus side is that you know, because the, uh, there's so much uh, diffusion uh, of, um, of presence in the industry, there's also less visibility into what's going on at each of these funds. Um, and so that, as I s sort of alluded to earlier, if a, fun if a fund manager is making certain decisions and those decisions are the best decision that can be made given that fund manager's understanding of the economy, given the interests of the, uh, of the investors, that decision may still have certain externalities which pooled with other external externalities by other investment advisors may lead to risks that n no one of those investment advisors may be aware of. Uh, aware of. And the only way to really uh, be cognizant of what's going on is to have data aggregation and collection. And really only the regulator can do that. Now, uh, there is some data that's already being provided. You have banks providing the, the uh, call reports. And recently, the, the large hedge funds have been um, uh, submitting form uh, PF. But the frequency with which these reports are provided are far from real time. I think the, the, the timeline is on the scale of months. And I've spoken to a, a former bank uh, trader who, who basically s who worked within the asset management, a bank managed fund within um, a major bank. And that person told me that the call reports are basically a pain in the ass. And there's just something to be filled out um, you know, right before D-Day, before it's, it's due. Uh, there's not a lot of credence that can be lent to the information in those reports, and um, you know, and, and as I said, the, the time frame is is really long. Um, decisions need uh, decisions are made on a millimeter, you know, nanosecond basis. A call report that's provided, you know, on a less uh, monthly or whatever basis is not really that helpful. So we need real time data collection by a regulator, um, and also the uh, you know for the for those of you that deal with covered funds. There's no data reporting for covered fund. Uh, sorry, um, separate separate accounts. There's no data reporting for separate accounts. So, uh, and that's a twenty trillion dollar industry. 
And that's a, that's, a, that's a big chunk of money that really no one has visibility on. So I think the solution really is increased disclosure. But so when, when you think of that, do you think of um, the increased disclosure to the regulator or that then the regulator makes available to the marketplace? Well, I think issues of confidentiality would obviously be paramount, um, just like uh, any kind of data that's provided to the government. But I think the, the reason I would suggest that data repository would be useful is because it would allow the regulator to per, you know, perform a diagnostic of current conditions uh, that would be more robust than current attempts and would also allow the regulator to have more accurate forecasts of what could be going on, what could be around the corner. All right, so I'm going to ask folks to start raising hands and turn it over to the uh, audience for questions. We've got about 15 minutes uh, left, so if you can get the hands going. Let me just, as you guys are doing that, let me just ask one quick, uh, quick question of, of Henry. Given, given your work, would it, would it be the case that if there were further improvements, and we can set aside in the interest of time what all those could be, to the disclosure regime that would allow investors to have greater understanding uh, about financial uh, institutions than may presently be the case uh, according to your work, that that would go a long way, uh, all the way, uh, some of the way, to uh, blunting the need for more substantive regulation uh, coming out of uh, wherever in the government. That disclosure, in effect, with market discipline uh, could go a long way, at least, to, to doing the work here uh, without much more by way of substantive regulation to address uh, some of the concerns that we're talking about today. It, it could go part of the way. I mean, the one basic issue, of course, is the, ex the uh, negative externalities of bank failure that bank shareholders don't absorb, right? So it, there's a conflict between the interests of uh, shareholders in terms of wanting maximized share price and what may necessarily be good for the point of view society. You have to, so you do have to have substantive um, uh, regulation uh, in addition to market discipline based on a robust informational pre predicate that's currently missing. And, and Khan mentioned, for instance, today there's going to be the, the stress test results uh, coming out. One of the examples of kind of a solution that I propose involving what I refer to as hybrid information, that is moderately pure information, is that the Fed should, rate, should dis fully disclose, notwithstanding the disadvantages, fully disclose precisely what models it uses in connection with the stress tests. So that way, the market can really figure out, have a way of, in a sense, interpreting those results and having kind of comparable data across banks. Right now, you have, for instance, J.P. Morgan rep, uh, offering their value at risk numbers at a 95% confidence level. Bank America offers it at 99% level. And then even within JPM in 2012, in connection with the London whale issue, they went through three different VA model, VAR models for the chief investment office, radically different numbers, not disclosing precisely how they calculated those models, but in each time basically saying, hey, we have a better model this time that, in fact, this is a serious issue and thing, and there's all kinds of solutions in terms of that go beyond intermediate depictions that can help in terms of this robust informational predicate that would go part of the way to dealing with, uh, you know, bank safety, soundness, and also issues like asset-backed securities. So Henry said something that I think got Paul's attention. Right. Um, number one. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? We didn't have a mic. Oh, Paul. <clears throat> Paul. Paul's question was an excellent one. Uh, Paul's question. Uh, oh, do you want to mention it? Yourself? I'll be repeat it. Okay. Um, my, my, Henry raises an important point about whether or not the models of regulators used in stress testing should be published, and it's it's a big issue that's going to run on for some years. And what I asked Henry to say is your subjective opinion 
of the probability of the models being gamed and the stress testing exercise becoming misleading were the models to be published. I mean, a richer version of the question is whether you think that the leaders of the firms have a sufficient grip over the insides of their firms to stop their staff gaming them, even if they wanted to. Um, num uh, number one, uh, one response is, uh, there's already gaming going on in terms of guessing what the models look like. The Office of Financial Research recently you know, had a, issued a report uh, basically suggesting that there was already a lot of gaming going on because through the use of consultancies and the like who try to you know, guess what the models kind of look like, right? And there's remarkable correlation between how banks do in terms of these models. Second response is, um, uh, of course, there, you know, there are problems um, with disclosure the Fed uh, disclosure models in terms of gaming. But I guess the issue is, you know, and, and the focus in terms of against disclosure has been, why, well, gee, uh, everybody's going to try to game those numbers, and so kind of uh, irrespective of whether the models are any good, you game your assets liability so that you look good in terms of num numbers. But there are a couple incentives that might run the other way. Each bank, of course, is trying to claim to potential um, clients, derivatives clients and the like, that is smarter than everybody else, right? Risk Magazine publishes Financial Engineer of the Year and so forth. You, have an, you may have an incentive also to show that, you, hey, here are the numbers under the Fed model, here are our numbers under our system, and here's where we're a lot smarter than the Fed. That it also may have incentives to basically show it has better models than the Fed in terms of capturing certain kinds of risks. And this kind of exercise, yes, it may lead to some kind of gaming, more gaming than occurs presently, but would help smoke out much more information about the models they use. Luckily, the Fed regulator, the bank regulator disclosure system is much more disciplined in terms of modeling than the SECs. The SEC, in terms of uh, SK-305 market risk rule, basically has, it gives incredible latitude to banks in terms of their VAR reporting. In contrast, in terms of the bank regulator VAR reporting, as you know, as you know, they have to approve the models, the, they have to test the models and report the quality, quantitative tests of their models. They ha all have to report at a 99% confidence level over a 10-day holding period, so much more specific. So um, my, an my, my short answer is yes, I acknowledge uh, the possible gaming, but I think on balance, I would argue that it probably helps. All right, other questions? Uh, I guess I have the mic so I get to go. Okay. Uh, Eric see. Reuter here at BU Law School. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. See me? Oh, and. Uh, formerly general counsel at Fidelity. Uh, so two questions. I, first of all, I agree with uh, the comments made earlier that we're talking about uh, funds that are long investors and uh, the claimants are equity claimants. <clears throat> and therefore, there, there's no real analogy to um, the fixed claimants uh, in the banking industry, uh, namely the depositors. But there are two types of debt uh, one on balance sheet, one off balance sheet for mutual funds that I'd like people to address. The on balance sheet debt is the uh, accounts payable for those investors, fund investors who've redeemed and now become debt claimants. Um, and in a, sp a downward spiraling market, the assets that were marked to market at four o'clock uh, on a prior day, now a day or maybe even more than one day later, those assets might not be capable of being sold at the price at which they were marked in order to term uh, to, to price the um, redemption of sh shareholders. I happen to think, but it's, I haven't done the research, that it's a very modest risk, but it seems to me if we want to look into um, forms of debt that might uh, tend to destabilize mutual funds, we ought to at least acknowledge that uh, equity claimants turn themselves into debt claimants when they redeem. And there, there's a time lag between the pricing of the redemption and the actual payment. 
the second, of course, is the off-balance sheet debt represented by derivatives. And um, we uh, still have the legacy of release 10666. Uh, I happen to think that's not a satisfactory way to deal with uh, derivatives. I actually don't think it comports with the 40 Act and the prescription against senior securities. So I'd like to hear uh, people's responses to those two points. Um, Eric, on, uh, with regard to the uh, responsibility for the payment of redemptions, uh, you know, that is a point that, that actually does exist uh, there. I think, you know, depending on how extreme the redemptions have been uh, and the time frame between uh, when the redemption is made and when it's paid, uh, um, you know, in extreme cases could, uh, uh, could be somewhat problematic. I would point out, I think, with the reserve fund, you know, when they were going through significant redemptions in a very short period of time, the NAV went from 99 down to, I think, 95 uh, because of that. Uh, now, of course, everybody wound up with uh, essentially 99 when things were, but it did, it points out that uh, you know, something that had been 1% became 5% by the time, uh, if, if I recall correctly, uh, uh, it wound up working its way through. So I think under certain circumstances, uh, that could be, uh, uh, could be an issue. Um, but I think that's one of the things that, uh, you know, that uh, Chair White has asked uh, the division to look at, which is how, you know, how, how to, uh, you know, how are you managing liquidity? How would you be uh, meeting redemptions? Um, so I think you know that is uh, uh, one of the things on the derivative side. I, I you know that is one of the things that uh, the division has been wrestling with. Uh, you know, which is how to effectively deal with uh, uh, with derivatives, and uh, I think that's also one of the initiatives that uh, Chair White um, has asked the division to uh, to deal with. So I th think you're right on on uh, both of those points. Somebody over here, I think, had a microphone. Which, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah about um, the information disparity that Henry touched on. Um, I think that after 2007, I think people forgot about uh, regulating high-frequency trading. Um, but I think that the reg NMS that was established in 2007 kind of fell short in 2010 after that flash crash. And I don't think the modifications have sufficiently addressed those. Um, the concerns that you know asset managers should have about the you know, the effects of their positions that they, you know, potentially don't have any control over from these high frequency trading um, firms and other, um, you know, very complex uh, financial uh, instruments. So I was wondering if you guys could touch on, you know, the possible regulations on, um, I guess, not complexity of financial in instruments, but um, either the reporting or the, uh, the possible restrictions of the you know, positions that these complex financial instruments can take within the market, because in 2010, uh, that flash crash really took a lot of positions out of the, uh, you know, took a lot of positions that asset managers had, um, you know, near, near nothing um, for something that they hadn't foreseen or um, had even considered before then. So we have five minutes and then a hard break, so if the answers can be brief. Um, very, very quickly, um, in a sense, the, the flash crash was interesting because uh, it all happened in the space of a couple of hours in the afternoon. And so things had recovered by the end of the day. In a sense, it would have been uh, much more, um, posed a lot more complex public policy issues if, in a sense, it hadn't recovered before the end of the day uh, in terms of everything from asset pricing and the like. So uh, in effect, the, the granularity with which you look Right, as you know, the various SEC and CFTC re staff reports had, had broken it down to fractions of a second in terms of behavior. And so uh, that's an interesting issue, and, and I think that's worth several conferences in terms of how, how you really should handle it, uh, HFT. Can I just chip in there? I, I think when I look back at the results over the last 10 or 20 years of, of our own experience of implementation shortfall um, globally, not just the US, it's declined. Uh, we have seen narrowing of bid our spreads, and HFT is absolutely part of that. But it's not an unalloyed uh, virtue. I think we all understand that, that there need to be guardrails. And you know, regulators have an important part to play to make sure there's no front-running and you know, activity is, is, is legitimate. And I think asset managers, 
frankly, have had to invest a lot in technology and people in order to understand those risks and to make smart choices about where they go down the algorithmic route. Um, but I, I, I think it has been on balance a good thing, um, but I would be willing to accept that there are guardrails that need to be put in place and, if necessary, reinforced. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I actually had a point on the last questioner. I think the last questioner raised a good point about the transition from equity to debt. I think we saw that in the MF Global case where people uh, had, a, had a tough time getting their money back. I think that just underscores the role that custody plays as part of the systemic issue. And we have time for at least a question. We'll see if we can get to the answers. But yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, just a, a comment be before the question. I, I think talking about the transparency effects of uh, pre-releasing uh, regulatory stress test is like talking about the transparency benefits of showing the students the test before it's given. I mean, they're there, but who does it, who does it come to? But I, I would just felt like to ask Richard Lakai a question about what you said about heterogeneity. Uh, you're, um, you, you, um, you, you probably uh, were present in the in an actor in the financial system during the days of Glass Steagall in the United States, and I was wondering if you thought that Glass Steagall created useful institutional and exposure heterogeneity within the financial system that we've uh, we've lost. And uh, the, the the second question is that um, if if one one trusts investors to arbitrage away this this kind of het heterogeneity, how does one explain the continued uh, the the repeated finding that asset market bubbles occur in experimental markets even when investors are fully informed and fully competitive. Gosh, they're, they're profound and, and lengthy <laughs> answers. Yeah, 60 seconds. Uh, 60 <laughs> seconds on Glass-Steagall. Uh, as you may have gathered from the accent, uh, when, when they abolished it, I lived in the UK, and we, we never had Glass-Steagall. We've had different regulation governing banking and securities markets, uh, and same in continental Europe. So there's always been an integration concept and universal banking. Uh, not to say there haven't been losses on investment banks that have affected uh, retail banks, but I guess if you look at the long history of banking, um, Money's been lost because people have lent to the wrong people, often for real estate-related reasons. Not to trivialize the investment banking losses and the fact that taxpayers shouldn't be in some way subsidizing that activity. But I think the, the nuanced approach that, that has been taken in some places of saying, look, taxpayers should not be necessarily supporting these activities, uh, but there are others that perhaps uh, promote uh, economic welfare that is good in principle. But the dividing line is awfully hard between lending, uh, again, as, as soon as you get into the insurance concepts of CDS and managing exposures, I think it becomes, the, the edges become very blurred. So I think it comes back to the, to the question of how you regulate and measure risk properly. And again, Henry's point about disclosure, how those uh, risk models are given appropriate light of day and subject to the right test, whether they're for lending against real estate or, or, a, or a CDS book. I think that's the key. I, I, I'm not sure I'd be um, a sort of Glass-Steagall, uh, you know, binary um, chooser to say it's, it's either Glass-Steagall or it's not. I think there's a, there are other ways of, of dealing with it. All right. So we are at the time for this panel to end. I want to thank BU. I want to thank ICI. I want to thank uh, all the panelists. And I'm sure the panelists would be more than happy to answer the questions you couldn't ask here uh, over lunch at some other time. So thanks, everybody. Thank you.